So, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So if you grew up in church, this song is probably so familiar to you that you're almost bored of it by now. I grew up in church. I, I like church. I love church. My dad is a well, seminary professor, uh, pastor, missionary. I, I've grown up going to church. I love it. This song, as I think about the song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. It's a simple, simple song. It's a sim I can even carry the tune. That's pretty impressive. It's a very simple song, but it's got very deep, deep truths in it. I never realized that until I was 18 years old and I'm working at camp. I'm sitting in the, the chapel service and I've got 10 young men that are in my charge for this week right there. I got to make them, you know, survive to Friday or Saturday, actually. Uh, you know, feed them, clothe them, make sure they get where they want to go and hopefully give them a little bit of God along the way. It hit me. They're, they're looking at the song. Their they're like, eyes are glazed. They're like, yeah, I'm going through the motions. Jesus loved me. This I know. What does this song really mean? What does it say? So let's just break it down. Jesus loves me. This I know. Okay. Jesus loves me. What does that say? The creator of creation, the one who, through whom everything is created, loves me enough that he died on a cross to pay for my sin. That's pretty profound. That's like the truth in the Christian faith, right? I know this. I don't think it. I'm not, eh, maybe so, but I absolutely know it for absolute certain. Why? Because the Bible says so. The most profound truth, the most foundational truth in the Christian faith, Jesus loves me. I know it because the Bible says so. I have a high view of Scripture. It's a simple children's song we stop singing about the time we get to kindergarten. The story I want to share with you today is from Luke 15. It's the prodigal son. Here's a story, probably the most popular New Testament story in the entire world. Very simple. Everybody knows it. But again, there's profound truths here that I think we need to listen to. So let's actually, we're going to read an entire chapter, Luke chapter 15. As it cruise over there, let me tell you a story. I I'm grew up in church, like I said, but I have a brother. I have an older brother. My older brother was... Um, how do you say it? Uh, well, a prodigal. He enjoyed doing his thing in his time, and I was the dutiful be-at-home kid and, you know, do the thing I'm supposed to do. Um, I was 15, and my brother was 17. He's a junior. I'm a freshman. And uh, my brother had a habit of not going to school. Um, and so my dad makes a deal with my brother. So I'll give you $2 a day. You've got to take this piece of paper and have all your teachers sign this paper saying you've been at school. I'll give you 2 bucks a day, 10 bucks a week just to go to school. I'm like, Dad, I want something like that. Can I do? I can take this paper out. I go to school every day. No problem. David, I want you to do dishes. Every day dishes, I'll give you a buck. Seven days a week, seven dollars doing dishes. Now, this is 1980, what, six or seven. So 10 bucks is not a small amount of money. And I'm, you know, a 15-year-old kid, so money motivates. I said, Dad, that doesn't seem fair. Because Don goes to school. He's supposed to do that anyway. I go to school every day. Pay me 10 bucks to go to school. I'm okay with that. Doing dishes, but that's, that's like work. My brother's supposed to go to school, right? There shouldn't be a pay to go to school. I shouldn't get paid when dad asks me to do dishes. I'll come back to that story in a minute. Just think through this, this idea. Let's read Luke 15. I'm starting in verse 1. Now, there were tax collectors and sinners that were all drawing near to him. That'd be Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one, does not leave the ninety-nine in open country and go after the one that was lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for him with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost, just so I tell you. There'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. 
Or what woman of you, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And, he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father felt, uh, saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet, and bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was out in the field. As he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brother has come home and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out to him and entreated him, begged him. But he answered his father, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and he is found. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the stories in your word. Thank you for stories because I love stories. God, I pray that you help me to show your words and your thoughts that you have given me. Help me to expose it well. But God, mostly help you, I pray that you speak through me. Help us to worship through hearing the word. Help me to worship through, through speaking the word that you might be glorified. We can always worship you in all we do. Thank you for what you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So stories. We, we tend to read the Bible not like other books. But let's pause for a minute in that thought and let's read the Bible like another book. Here's a story. Two brothers and a father. These are three characters in the story, right? We have to think about characters because characters are important. Anytime you read a story, there's a character, right? So here we go. Younger son. Younger son. He, if you go back to, to verse one, we got the tax collectors and sinners and we got the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, the younger son, he's kind of identified with these tax collectors and sinners. He's the rebellious, go off and do my own thing, have a good time. Yeah. So this young son, not sure how young he is, younger, he comes to his dad and says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Now, you didn't read that, did you? But, but this is what he said. He said, Dad, give me the portion of the property that is coming to me. When does that property come to him? When dad is dead. Give me my inheritance, dad. Give it to me now. And dad says, all right, here you go. We'll talk about dad here in a bit. 
we'll get there, I, I promise. But this is an audacious, unreasonable request. Dad, give me what's mine and give it to me now, even though it's not mine until you die. Give it to me now. And dad says, okay, here you go. Now, dad is dad, right? Dad's a dad. He, he understands probably this young man is not going to do something wise. But he gives the money anyway. So this young man takes off. Not many days later, he takes off and travels to far off country where he, quote, scan, squandered his property in reckless living. Now, I don't think we have to work too hard to imagine what he's doing. But we can't say he's not doing anything good, right? He's enjoying, enjoying life in, in a secular turn. He, he's I'm assuming doing things he doesn't want to do in his hometown or he can't do in his hometown. He's doing this over there so that the prying eyes of dad and dad's friends and those who know dad, those who know his name, don't say, oh, look, we got to tell dad. So I'm a Brashears. Um, Brashears is a name um, in the right circles. It's fairly popular. My dad is, he's, anyway. In the right circles, people know my dad. Um, so in any of the CB circles, CB Northwest, the associated churches we're involved in, um, in any of those circles, if I say Brashears, they oh, yeah, you know Gary, right? Oh, yeah, that's my dad. Oh, yeah. So, so if David Brashears does something goofy, my dad hears about it. I promise he does. If David does something good, my dad hears about it. I promise he does, because he usually calls us, what happened? If this young man goes home, and, and people know his dad, and he does something goofy, Dad's going to hear about it. So he goes somewhere else, runs away. I don't want to do it here. I'm going to do it somewhere else because then I won't get caught. R.C. Sproul says, said, I guess he, he's passed away now. He said, uh, sin brings pleasure, but never brings happiness. Sin is fun in the moment. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. There's fun. There's, there's pleasure there, but there's never happiness. It never continues. It's like, wow, that's great. And now, oh, shoot, I got to deal with the consequences. The son has now got to the end of the consequence. He's out of money. I don't have anything. So what am I doing? I'm, I'm going to go hire myself out. He says, I hire myself out to, to, a, um, to a citizen, and he's out feeding the pigs. And he's, he wants to be fed what the pigs are eating, which I cannot believe is good. It's like, well, that looks pretty good. I guess I'll grab that corn cob and chew on that. I don't, I don't know. What do you feed pigs? I don't, I'm not a pig guy. Feeding pigs. This is a Jew feeding pigs. Pigs are unclean. They're, they're, they're not cool animals. I'm not sure they're cool animals anyway. But anyway, I'm feeding pigs, and I want to eat what they're eating because that's better than what I'm getting. And it says no one gave him anything. Now, I don't think what he's, what he's saying here is that, that his, his boss, the guy who's hired him, hasn't paid him his wage. I think what's happening is he spent all this time with money. And he's got friends because, well, he has money. Nathan invites him to his house and goes over and, hey, Nate, I'm coming to your house. Oh, that's great, dude. Bring some beer. Sorry, Nate. I just rather. <laughs> Nathan's not a beer drinker. Anyway, bring some beer. Come on over, right? Another friend, hey, come on over. Yeah, that's great, Con. Just bring some girls there with you. He's got the money, and so he's, he's being invited to all the parties, and, and people are giving him stuff. But now he doesn't have the money, and no one's given nothing. He's got to earn everything he's got. And this, he comes to his senses. The NIV, he comes to his senses. ESV, he, he comes to himself. He realizes what's happening. He saw the light. He understood the reality of the situation. Dad was right. Because I imagine dad had conversations. Many, not many days later he left. I'm sure there's some conversations. Son, I'm going to give this money. But I want you to use it wisely. I want you to be smart with this money. It's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, dad, no problem. Dad was right. He understands right. But he also understands he's not worthy to be his son anymore. So he devises this plan. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go visit my dad. I'm going to say, dad, I'm not worthy of being your son. I can't be your son anymore. Just let me be your hired hand. Let me be your employee. I'll come and work the fields. I'll go live in town. I'll come, just, just get my paycheck. I'll go home and I'll buy my groceries and do my own thing. But just let me work in your fields. Let me, let me earn my way back into the community. 
and maybe somehow possibly back into your family. But I don't really have any hope of that because I'm not worthy of that. So he takes the long walk. I'm sure it's a longer trudge, longer trudge, longer journey. There you go. Back home than it was going out. Because going out, he's skipping, he's excited. Come back, he's like, oh, dad's going to kill me. He's coming back, and, and he comes to dad and says, dad. And he's, he's, I'm sure, rehearsing this in his brain, right? He's getting closer to home. He's like, okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say like this. I got, got the right, I got it all right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. He comes through the lane, and here's dad. And all of a sudden, he sees dad running at him. He's going, oh, crap. He's going to kill me. No, dad grabs him, a huge bear hug, and is weeping. And King James says he laid on his neck. I love that. This is just, uh, just, you can't get any closer. I'm just like, ah, yes. My son is home. He says, dad, dad, I'm not worthy. Sorry, I didn't say that. He says, father, because he's not, he's, he doesn't, dad's not good, right? Dad is way too familiar. Father, forgive me. I've sinned against, you know, I've sinned against heaven. I don't deserve to be your son. And then dad cuts him off. Hey, servant, go get the best robe. Whose robe is the best robe in the house? It's dad's robe. This is my son. This is, this is me. Hey, go get a ring. What is the ring? This, this is like a signature card so you can sign on the checkbook. You can, you can pay money on the, the family account. This is my son. Go get him shoes. He's not a servant. He's not a slave. He's not a low-age worker. He is my son. Put shoes on his feet. This is my son. This is my son. This is my son. Now let's go kill the fatty calf and party. You are my son. Let's go have a party. It's great. If the story ended here, man, what a beautiful story, right? Here we are, we've, we've come back, and, and Father has, has grabbed this young man in his, in his, in his arms, and yes, my son has returned, party, and the whole town's coming. Remember back the first two stories, we get lost, sought, found, party. Lost, the loser seeks and finds, and we have a party. Lost, where's the seeker? Dad didn't go looking for his son. We have to read the next part of the story. Let's talk about the elder son. The elder son, this, this is the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the, the dutiful, good, religious Jews from this story. This son is off in the field doing his job. Because that's what he always does. I'm not doing my job. I'm working. I'm working the field. Whatever. I don't know what he's doing. He's, he's in the fields. Who knows what he's doing? Feeding cows. Kicking the horses. Oh, no, sorry. Um, whatever. I, I don't know what he's doing, but he's out doing it. He's out, he's out trying to, to do what dad wants him to do, trying to discover. And, and he comes to the house, and the party's bumping. Right? The house is shaking. The DJ's going. It's having a great time. Lights and probably not. Uh, anyway, but it says he heard the music and he heard dancing. He hears them going. He hears it. He feels the bump of the party. I don't know if you guys, I'm a Portlander. I grew up in Portland. You drive by a club at night. I'm sorry, that's true. You drive by a club at night and the party's going on and you can kind of see through the door because it's always open. There's people going in and out and there's people dancing. You can see them having a good time and you can feel boom, 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 boom. You can just feel it. And you're like, man, they're having a good time in there. This is what the son is seeing, right? This elder son, he's coming close. Like, and so he said, what's going on? Somehow he missed the memo. I'm not sure how. The whole town is here partying, but he missed the memo. Anyway, he has headphones on out in the field. I don't know. Uh, he missed the memo. It's coming on. So he comes and says, servant, what's going on? Well, your, your brothers come home and we're celebrating because your dad said we've got to kill the fatted calf because, man, this is great. And the response should be, yeah, let's go party. But it's not. He's angry. And he won't go in the house. Dad comes out to him. Oh, seeker. Has been sought. Dad comes out to him and entreats him. You can read this. He begged him, pleaded with him. Please come into the house. Please party. Your son, your brother is here. And we're celebrating because we thought he was dead. We thought we'd never have him back. We have him back. We're going to celebrate. 
and refuses to go in. In fact, he responds, verse 29. He answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Inside the house is the whole town in a fatted calf. Dad, I want to have a barbecue with my buddies. Son, in that house are your buddies and their wives and their kids and the rest of the town and a big old fatted calf. And you want a barbecue? Son, you're nuts. Sorry, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. That's dad's response, huh? The elder son refuses to honor his father's request. I'm not going back in there, dad. It's not going to happen. In fact, in a sense, the elder son is doing the same thing the younger son did earlier. Remember, the younger son said, dad, I wish you were dead because I want your money. Here, the elder son is saying, dad, you have failed me. You'd be better off if you were dead. Because everything you're partying with is my stuff. Remember, the, they split the, the money, right? So, so younger son's already got his inheritance. So everything left is elder son's inheritance. So dad's spending his son's inheritance to, to party for younger son. Younger son's upset. He won't go into the party. He says, this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. The son of yours. He's not my brother. He's your son. The son of yours. He's distancing himself from the, from the younger son. He's also distancing himself from dad. You are they. I am me. And I've worked my tail off to make sure you're happy. I've done everything you asked me. I know what you asked and I've done it before you asked me because I know my job, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I've worked hard to make sure you're pleased with me. Dad, would be better off if you weren't here. There's no resolution to that end, but we'll come back to that idea. The father. Now, you probably figured this out already. Younger son, scribes and Pharisees, no, sorry, younger son, sinners, tax collectors, elder son, scribes and Pharisees. Dad, well, that's the God figure. This is God. Tim Keller wrote a book several years ago called Prodigal God. Um, and he argues that God is the prodigal in the story. So know that we have to define prodigal. So I went to my favorite place, the dictionary. Um, who's uh, prodigal? The definition of dictionary, Webster, Webster Miriam Webster.com says a prodigal de defined one who spends or gives lavishly or foolishly, extravagant, squandering, wasteful, or one who is these things. Okay, so spends lavishly, gives lavishly, foolishly. That, that's the definition of prodigal. Younger son comes with an unre unreasonable request, and dad says, what, what should dad say? Get out of my house. There's no, never any inheritance for you. Go away. In fact, leave town. I don't ever want to see you again. That'd be a proper response in the first century. You're dead to me. If you come back, you'll be dead. That should be the proper response, but that's not what he does. He divides the inheritance. Now, this isn't like going cash in your 401k and split it and give a check to your son. That's not how it works. I have to go and sell off property. Sell off some cattle sell off some fields, sell off some grain I have in the storeroom so I can get the money that would be to you. It's not like, all right, done. It's a huge effort, but dad says I'm going to do it. I would call that lavish. I would call that foolish because I'm giving it to a young son. Here's someone who, who obviously, I mean, obviously, but dad, I want your money. What do you think he's going to do with it? I'm not going to stick around. Foolish. When the son comes back, this, young, this man 
runs to him. He sees him from, from far off. Okay, this is David doing his thing because I think about things and I tell stories and I like stories and I got to think through him in between the lines here, right? So here's my line, my, my thought. As, as this young son takes his pack and he's skipping down the road heading off to this far off land, the father watches him go with tears in his eyes and says, oh, oh here he goes. And maybe in my vision, he prays that he comes back eventually. I'm at reconciled to this son. But, but he goes, he watches him go. And then every day he's coming back to the end of the lane and looking down. Oh, not today. And after a while, it's just become habit. Every time you go check the mail, you look down the lane. Nope, not today. I don't know how long it's been. We have no idea how long it is. But eventually he sees someone walking down the path. And he's like, I kind of recognize that walk. Could it be? No, no, that would be. He gets a little closer. Oh, wait, I recognize that. That's my son. And what does he do? Take off running. They're wearing scary ropes. Sorry. He girds up his loins. Tuck that in here. Take off running. Now, again, we missed this from Western eyes. It is not proper for a man to run. It's not proper. You just don't do it. A young children run. They play. They have a good time. A young man might run for sport. You know, the Olympics come along once in a while. Um, they might run for work or something they do. But but for, for an elder statesman to run, it's just not proper. He does it anyway. He runs to his son. He wraps his arms around his son. He lays on his neck and he weeps. My son has come home. It's not proper. To showing that kind of affection out in the world, it's just not proper. You don't do that kind of thing. But he did that kind of thing. It's foolish. He restores sonship. This is a young man who has proven to waste everything he had. But instead of saying, all right, you can come be a servant, he says, you're my son. You are my son. You are my son. I want you in my family, not just in my house. I want you in my family. I want you part of me. You are my son. And I'm going to give you the checkbook as well. Foolish. It's foolish. To the elder son, he goes out to him. Okay, a host doesn't leave the party. It's just not done. You don't do that. I mean, today it'd be kind of, you know, whatever. But you just don't go out, leave the party. I'm hosting the party on the MC. I got to make sure everything happens and everything's going. Everybody's having a good time. That's my job. But I can leave these guys and go talk to this guy on the porch. I'm going to beg my son to come. I'm not going to order him. Get in there. Get in there, young man. No, I have every right to do that, but he doesn't do that. He says, he says, please, please come in and celebrate with your brother. It's right to celebrate. Everything this man is doing is not what he should be doing. But he does it anyway. Back to the old stories. We have a seeker, lost something, I seek it, and I find it, and I celebrate. Who's the lost? The younger son has now returned. He's in the party having a good time. The elder son, he's being sought. Please, son, come. Please come. Come join the party. You belong inside. You are part of the family. You belong inside with your brother. In ancient days, there were Jews and there was everybody else. The Gentiles, the Greeks, they're called all kinds of different things. But there are Jews, God's chosen people, and there's everybody else. In today's world, we got the church folks and we got everybody else. Okay, I'm a church folk. I, told, I grew up in church. I love church. I've been in church my whole life. Um, as a kid, I went to church because I had to. And as an adult, I go to church because I love it. I, I want to be in church. I, I want to be somewhere where I can worship Jesus with other people. And it, it, it's right. And it's beautiful. We must do it. There's everybody else. Does their own thing. They'll hang out, do their thing, whatever. I don't care. 
with their own things. Paul kind of makes a divide, a similar divide to, to the, the young son, the, the sinner tax collector, and he, he calls them the, the irreligious lost or, or the rebellious lost. They go do their own thing. And Romans chapter 1, read these ideas that these guys just, they know God, they have every opportunity to know God, but they just turn their back on him. They don't want to. And our guest today's back here, they give him the middle finger and say, well, walk away. I don't want anything to do with you, God. I'm out of here. And there's the religious lost, the dutiful lost. They, they do everything by the book. They follow the rules, every single one of them. But they're also lost. You see, the rules aren't there in order to make us right. Uh, I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 3. Is that what I want? Yeah, Romans chapter 3. Starting in verse 9. We got the dutiful lost. We got the rebellious lost. Other sides, if I keep myself consistent. Rebellious, over and dutiful, that doesn't matter. You don't, you don't care. I just, it's me. These two lost groups... And this is what God says. This is Paul writing to the Romans, uh, Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks, both those in the church and those outside the church, are under sin, as it is written. There's a big old long list of stuff, but many quotes from the Old Testament. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their venom, sorry, the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of law, no one, no one, no human being will be justified in the sight, in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified. This is not a new concept for Paul. Paul says it a lot, but if you fly back to Psalm 51, give a little context, Psalm 51 is the, um, David's response after he's been confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. And if you're not totally familiar with that story, let me give you this quick rundown. Uh, David um, seduces, I'll say it that way, um, a woman uh, has, gets her pregnant, um, while her husband's off at war, um, brings her husband home to try and cover up this sin, and he's too honorable to go be with his wife. Then he sends him, this husband, with a letter back to his commander, saying basically let this guy in the front and then draw back so this guy dies. So I can take his wife to be my wife, and then everything will be okay. Okay, this is terrible, right? So we got adultery, we got conspiracy to commit murder, we got murder, we've got lying and all that kind of stuff going on. Okay. So David is finally, he is confronted uh, with Nathan. Great story. You can go find it sometime. Um, maybe sometime I'll preach that one. I don't know. Invite me next, next time and I'll, I'll talk to Aaron. Anyway, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done whatever is evil in your sight so that you be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth in the inward being. You search, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, that I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones that were broken rejoice. 
Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from, from blood guiltness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will de declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure and build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the right sacrifices in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. You will delight in the offerings. They're given rightly. God doesn't want our duty. He doesn't want us to obey his every law out of duty. He wants us to obey his every law, follow his every precept out of love. I love you, God, so I'm going to do what you have asked me to do. That's where God is going. That's what this elder son is missing. The younger son has come and said, I failed, I'm worthless. And he's been restored. The older son is saying, I've done it all right. In Mark chapter two, Jesus says this, those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. The wonderful, beautiful, difficult thing we must remember is we are all sinners. None of us are righteous. Jeremiah, the, the, none are righteous. No, not one, not a single one of us. Our great, wonderful, faithful deeds, tilthy rags. I'm going to present my diaper to you, God, and say, this is my great, wonderful stuff. This is how great I am. That's how great we are. That's, that's how good we are in God's sight. See, there is God and there is everyone else. Are you a churchgoer? You've been going to church your whole life? Are you like me and you, and you, you I was in church probably before I was born. My, my daughter, I, I tell you, anyway, sorry. I told Nathan, can I speak about my, about my kids? My daughter, Joy, was literally in church on the way home from the hospital. She was born Friday night, Saturday morning, Sunday morning on the way home from the hospital. We stopped by the church before we went home. Okay, I'm, I don't know if that was true for me, but, but I'm in that same vein, right? I'm always in church. I was always there. I've done it all right. I've said the right prayers and done the right things and read the right books and I read to my Bible every year and I make sure I get it right and I do this and I do that. I'm always at church and I, and I sing and I serve and I do all these things. But if I do it in order to earn God's favor, Father, I've done everything you've commanded me and not once have you given me a goat. Come on, folks. The party's inside. If you're one of those who, who has walked perfectly with God your whole life and you haven't said, God, I don't deserve to be your son. I don't deserve to be your daughter. And you're still in the wrong place. Are you this rebel that's been gone doing your own thing for your whole life? I've got a friend at church that, that I talked to him yesterday. We're talking and he's like, he's like yeah, I, I, I don't have the gift of growing up in church. I had to find God through other ways. So in college, he sees Jesus and it completely changes his life. A great godly man, loves the Lord, loves Jesus and loves to share it. But he didn't have the privilege of growing up in church. Or maybe he didn't have the curse of growing up in church. Kind of depends on how you look at it. He didn't have the, the history of doing right because right is what you should be doing. He had the privilege of seeing God in his mess and God coming and rescuing from that mess. 
he understands his mess easily. Those of us who are good Christians, it's harder for us to see our mess. But we're still in mess. We still need God. How do you bring this plane to the landing? I, off my notes, been off my notes for a while. So here's where I'm going to land. I'm going to put it right here. God doesn't care if you are the worst sinner in the world and you have done all the bad things. If you come to him and say, Father, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I'm not worthy of being your son. That's the moment he comes and grabs hold of you and says, you are my son. If you've been dutiful and doing your job right, perfectly your whole life, and you, you haven't stepped one toe out of line, yet you come to God and say, Father, I'm not worthy of being your son. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. He says, wraps some around, he says, you are my son. You are my daughter. You are part of this family, and that's where you belong. Come enter into my rest. Come to the party and enjoy. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. God, I pray to help us to see our need. Give us a heart to see who you are. Give us minds to see who we are, and give us the courage to come to you and say, God, I need you. Help us to understand our place, that it's not by our righteousness, but it is by your sacrifice that we might come to you. For it is you who have done. You are the one who has done what we need. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.